I'm going to talk today about, um, you're actually going to get a double whammy because my good friend Dr. Jack Call is going to talk about biologic dentistry and really all the different aspects of, um, of biologic dentistry that's, that's fascinating. And, you know, I, I like to say that, you know, oral health is the 800-pound gorilla in the room for the wellness movement because so many of my colleagues in biologic medicine and functional medicine and uh, they are toxicity experts in the gut and, and there's a big disconnect between uh, dentistry and medicine that I believe is starting to come back together. And the center in Providence that's under construction right now is one such place uh, along with Paracelsus in Switzerland where dentistry and medicine um, uh, cannot be separated from one another. Uh, so you really can't have a healthy mouth, I can't have a healthy body without a healthy mouth. And the father of the mouth-body connection um, is a man by the name of Weston Price. And if you mention Weston Price to most dentists, they wouldn't even know who he is. Yet he's probably one of the most influential people in health and wellness. Um, that's, you know, and, and a dentist, he founded the research arm of the uh, American Dental Association, but he was speaking about the mouth-body connection um, right here in 1917. He was talking about the present status of our knowledge of the relationship of mouth infection to systemic disease, uh, disease. and at this conference he was laughed at and, and it was scorned uh, this concept that, uh, you know, something that's going on in a tooth can have an effect on the body. So little did we know, but from that I actually wrote this book uh, talking about, and I wrote this book, this is a great book for your patients who are not educated in this, wor uh, in this area. It's a great book because I wrote it for the guy who was on the drive through at Burger King, you know, like, and just getting him to think differently and understanding this very intimate connection between what goes on in the mouth and the rest of the body. And so, and I talk about the mouth as a mirror of what's going on in the body. Like here, you know, everything from diabetes, leukemia, and tuberculosis have signs in the mouth. Parasites, signs in the mouth. Um, you know, mycotic, everything um, about, there's an estimate of 80%. James, you could probably no, no more than me, that have manifestations in the mouth, uh, manifestations of systemic disease. So we've known this a long time. The tongue, um, tongue analysis. Um, you could see everything in, in the tongue from tuberculosis, vitamin deficiencies, um, mycon you know, candida, everything. Um, but then we have this very interesting and intimate connection of the, uh, of the mouth as a gateway. And, uh, and that always really fascinates me. Uh, the study last week came out that you have um, periodontal bacteria, periodontal pathogenic bacteria, so bacteria that are expressing themselves pathogenically. Uh, this whole idea of good bug, bad bug, you know, and, you know, we went from the germ theory to the good bug, bad bug, and now this whole microbiome understanding is radically changing our understanding. And I'm going to speak about that in just a little bit. Uh, because, the, believe it or not, the, the, our mindsets, many of our mindsets as doctors, as healthcare practitioners, are still from the, uh, from the place that we have to modify the expression of these bacteria. We control them. Uh, when in actuality, and, uh, and this becomes a, um, you know, a, a great cosmic uh, um, understanding has shifted. They're calling it a Copernican revolution. So Copernicus said the Earth was not the center of the universe. Um, we are not the center of our universe, um, and the bacteria really run us. We don't run them. So um, very interesting shift. But um, So we can't ignore the 800-pound gorilla. Gorilla's brushing with Revitin, by the way. <laughs> so uh, toxicity danger number one, I always put gum disease as toxicity danger number one. 
because um, the statistics are alarming. Um, there's, it's now you know upwards of 85% of adults over 35 have some stage of periodontal disease, gum disease, and why is that? You know, I came out of dental school in 1983, and gum disease was epidemic then, and here it is, 2018, and a lot of that has to do with how we, you know, how we treat our microbes. I mean, that's basically it. We've discovered that bacteria, is this gonna blow? <laughs> so, uh, back, <clears throat> bacteria in the mouth actually remove, uh, I, I feel like there's a truck gonna be backing into here. <laughs> bacteria in the mouth, thank you. Bacteria in the mouth actually act as, a, as an intelligent semi-permeable membrane. So bacteria take, and they've shown, that the oral microbiome transports ionic calcium and phosphorus from saliva to mineralize teeth. And it's called the dentocyalomicrobial complex. Um, these same bacteria transport molecular oxygen to your gums and take ionic oxygen and free radicals away from your gums. So this maintenance uh, is, being, is taking place. You don't need fluoride, everybody. And as Dick Tom said, you know, if you want a calcified pineal gland or an underfunction, hypothyroid, hypothyroidism, or how about 50 studies, 50 studies, and Harvard did a meta-analysis of these 50 studies and confirmed that consuming fluoridated water lowers IQ in children. And it disproportionately affects African Americans, lowering IQ even more. So 50 studies decreasing IQ, and a lot of those studies came out of China. Um, so the link between gum disease to systemic illness, well established, and past approaches uh, or have not only been ineffectual, it's not just it, it's ineffectual, but it's, it's harmful. So we actually promote the advance of a pathogenic expression of bacteria in the mouth uh, by trying to kill it. So Time Magazine, this was 2001, identified gum disease as the body's number one chron uh, source, number one source of chronic low-grade inflammation. So chronic low-grade inflammation, number one source is the mouth, gum disease. And gum disease, so let me just talk about acute inflammation. Acute inflammation is a very necessary process of regulation, of bioregulation and self-healing. Um, but, but chronic low-grade in inflammation is like a silent alarm bell going off that no one's answering. And that's where you have these ravaging effects on, on many different parts of the body. Um, great book I read in the 90s was by Paul Ewald, who wrote Plague Time, and he was talking about stealth infections. And in fact, many of those stealth infections are in the mouth, and I, uh, I think Dr. Call's probably gonna speak about cavitations and things like that. There is, um, it seems like there is a, um, uh, an epidemic of cavitational diagnosis going on, and yes, there is, because we never could see them before. Cone beam um, has um, created a diagnostic tool where we can look 3D in the jar. And we've discovered that upwards of 85% of wisdom teeth extractions end up forming dental cavita uh, jaw cavitations. And it's a perfect place for all kinds of pathogens to hang out, uh, including Lyme spirochetes. And, and uh, they've They've cultured all kinds of things. Um, and I didn't want to touch upon that because I don't want to steal my good friend Dr. Call's thunder. <laughs> but I, um, uh, I'm sort of, I want to try and be the warm up act. So inflammation has ravaging effects on organ systems throughout the body and everything from Alzheimer's uh, to pancreatic cancer, uh, uh, colon cancer, colorectal cancer. Uh, last month, Journal of Oncological Medicine, March, um, not last month, March 2018, found that periodontal bacteria, uh, the most common oral bacterium, Fusobacterium nucleatum, which is 
a um, pretty nasty bug when it's pissed off. And, uh, and we do that a lot. But it's a, com a community bacterium, the most common oral bacterium, um, has ravaging effects all over the body. But it was the number one bacteria found in colorectal tumors. Very interesting. And then just last week, study came out, 2018, um, that these periodontal bacteria um, really mess up uh, ca causing lipid uh, d dysregulation. It lowers HDL. So periodontal bacteria uh, lowering HDL. Um, so the four pathways um, we like to say uh, that we, I, I like to talk about is there's the direct effects of these uh, oral infectious pathogens getting in and ba basically being found in plaques around, in arteries around the heart and, and all of that. But then there's the inflammatory response. So these pathogens get in to the bloodstream and trigger the li liver to release C-reactive proteins, which has inflammatory effects on our entire circulatory system. And then there's those degenerative effects on the endothelium and, and vascular integrity. But the fourth one is really interesting, is this idea that we um, change to a more pro-inflammatory genotype. Um, and uh, that is why this is, um, in my opinion, gum disease is the one, number one dental danger. Um, so here's a study uh, Journal of Oral Microbiology, Porphyromonas gingivalis, a common bacterium in the mouth. Uh, but most closely associated in its pathogenic state, most closely associated with um, gum disease, one of the primary bacteria in gum disease detected in coronary and femoral or arteries. And um, here's the uh, autoimmune reactivity um, caused by oral pathogens. This was another research study from actually out of Serbia and the U.S. And then uh, how about young pregnant women uh, young pregnant women at great risk. I, uh, I had a, um, a woman come into my office yesterday before I left for the airport who um, just had a baby, she says, beautiful baby, seven weeks old, and she's coming in for a cleaning now. And I said, you should have been having a cleaning, a dental cleaning, um, at least once every trimester um, because you know, they used to say that, you know, pregnant women, you know, lost teeth because the baby robbed the mother's calcium during pregnancy, and that's a, an old wives' tale. What we know is that there are hormonal changes that cause um, what's known as pregnancy gingivitis. Gums get inflamed, they bleed. So periodontal disease um, actually um, progresses um, pretty quickly during pregnancy, but it has a devastating effect on, on the, uh, on the health of the mother and the baby. So preeclampsia and pre low weight, premature low weight babies um, related to um, periodontal disease. And this, you know, the inflammatory response um, from the periodontal disease stimulates prostaglandin cytokine production to stimulate labor. And so premature low weight babies are most often born with complications like cerebral palsy and things like that. So how do we go from healthy gums to advanced periodontitis? Or what I like to say is here's this beautiful brownstone block uh, in Brooklyn. How does it go from that to that? Um, and you know, how did these communities that, you know, my, my dad took me to a community he grew up in Brooklyn where there were these beautiful, um, really beautiful brownstones uh, at one time, and you know, they were built in the 1800s, and they, and some of them have such grand features and stairways and everything, and then it turned into this, and it's because, you know, people moved out. My dad grew up in a community which was Irish and Italian and German and Jewish, and it was just very diverse, uh, and everyone sort of supported each other as this big, beautiful, diverse community. And that's what happens in a healthy microbiome. So that's a macrocosm of what happens in a microcosm in a healthy microbiome. But when there are outside environmental influences and social policies and things like that that cause a breakdown of the social strata, the social fabric, um, 
we see destruction. And that's what we do in the mouth. We have really kind of been taking an approach that has been all wrong. It's kind of like I like to say, since the emergence of the Human Microbiome Project, um, everything we knew about health and disease has changed. And so it all boils down to this. We used to look at the microbiome by scraping a little plaque off of teeth, putting it on a microscope, and seeing all these bugs swim around. And we were not really looking at the indigenous community. We were looking at um, what's known as planktonic bacteria. And this film, this sticky, smelly film that's on people's teeth in the morning is a disturbed or imbalanced um, oral microbiome. It's imbalanced. Because when it's in balance, it's a thin, clear, odorless film, which does some very important things, like I mentioned, bringing nutrients and to hard tissue and soft tissue in the mouth and taking waste products away. So there's this very intimate communication, but we have only looked at, in the past, until we started using some sophisticated diagnostic tools, we were only looking at planktonic or free-floating bacteria. And there's transient pathogens always. There's always uh, a policing and a cleaning up of the environment that goes on with the oral microbiome. And so the Human Microbiome Project changed everything. Um, we are made of microbes. So this past summer, I did a little uh, biblical check because it never sat right with me that um, that the verse in Genesis chapter two, verse seven, that says, and God took from the dust of the earth and, and breathed his spirit into it. So I kind of um, looked at, this was Scientific American, uh, an article back in 2015 that slimy microbes carpeted the earth 3.2 billion years ago. So then I went back to the Hebrew text in uh, in Torah, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, and it actually does not translate to dust. It actually translates to the Lord God form man of the slime of the earth and breathe into his face the breath of life, his spirit, and man became a living soul, mind, body, and spirit. And I felt better. <laughs> that dust word never sat right with me. <laughs> um, so it's very interesting when you look at our mitochondria and, and, and a bacterium and just the, uh, the membranes and the DNA and how they divide. And you could say maybe our mitochondrians, and a lot of scientists are starting to believe that uh, our mitochondrion were, were, you know, were engulfed in a cytoplasm, and, um, but that consciousness came from the microbes, the consciousness. Um, that connection to the universe is in the DNA of those microbes. There are 10 times the microbes than our own human cells in and on our bodies, but the genetic information is 100 times, 100 times. So the oral microbiome, essential for life, protection against pathogens, uh, an important component of digestion pathways, salivary immune system regulation. Where we want to be is the center of this, um, where that blue circle is. That's a healthy, balanced microbiome, which has more aerobic than anaerobic. To the right, um, and I'll show you in the next slide, so homeostasis is in the center, and this is a graphic analysis of what that center is. The larger the circle, the greater the host resistance. So, you know, our microbiome in our mouth shifts all the time depending on diet and nutrition and stress, cortisol levels. I mean, there's all kinds of things that shift not only the microbiome in our gut, but also in the mouth. And so, you know, the major micro microbiomes that we tend to refer to is, is, you know, the gut is always the big one. And, the mouth is, is big, and then there's a respiratory, genital, urinary, skin microbiome, big one. And so we find that disease is related, like 
psoriasis is a study at New York University Medical Center. Psoriasis was found to be a microbiome imbalance on the skin. You know, all these autoimmune conditions that we didn't have, um, you know, unknown ideology, um, we're starting to find a lot has to do with our, um, the state of our microbial um, um, composition. So in here, in the center of the drug, so if you look to the right, on the bottom you see soft tissue responses. Those are oxidation reduction. So when you go to the right and you see this thick, scary stuff, you see some spirochetes in there, and all kinds of the whole environment changes. The aerobic layer gets stomped down like, uh, like a stampede in, you know, like, like a, you know, even you know, tragic stampede conditions with humans. You know, there's people, you know, running through, there's a fire in a, in a crowded place. They stamp down the, the aerobic. That's what happens with our microbiome. And conversely, uh, I'm gonna show you just, oops. Conversely, when you go to the left, you see hypertrophic is to the right, atrophic is to the left. Atrophic, now how do you get an atrophic microbiome? Chemotherapy, radiation, smokers, coconut oil pulling. Yeah, did you hear me? Okay, oh, everybody's like, oil pulling, oil pulling, great, great Ayurvedic thing, great Ayurvedic thing. There's nothing magical about oil pulling, Ayurveda, um, um, recommended it as a temporary process when you have, and it's interesting because it's a detergent, it's a lipophilic action that um, is a detergent effect of removing unhealthy plaque, thick, sticky, smelly film, this stuff on the right. So I'm not opposed to oil pulling but I'm opposed to people doing it every day because it's good for you. Every day, every day. Because what they do is they shift their flora from hypertrophic to atrophic because it strips charcoal, activated charcoal. Great, activated charcoal. When I'm, I give every patient that's getting mercury removed out of their teeth activated charcoal because it's a very powerful binder it binds to everything, and yes, it binds to the microbiome. So activated charcoal will result in an atrophic biofilm, an atrophic microbiome. Everybody knows that biofilm was the word up to 2002 when Josh Lederberg recoined the phrase microbiome, which sounds a lot nicer. So the microbiome uh, became the buzzword, and biofilm became a dirty word. Um, so uh, what else? Uh, charcoal, clay. Clay is a binder too. So you see all of these zany natural products that come out that don't really understand the full science. You know, they take one thing, it's like kind of like the, remember the fat-free diet, the fat-free diet and people's hair was falling out and their nails were cracking and then we had, right? It's almost, it's almost like Dick when you said, you know, it was first it was fibromyalgia, then it was candida, and then and now everybody has Lyme disease. But, you know, it's, it's we, we, um, we tend to kind of gather around the, you know, the, the hot topic of the moment, you know, what the, uh, the hot word is. Everybody's throwing around the microbiome word now. Um, the future, by the way, in oral care and our research right now is on salivary production because saliva is the lifeblood of the mouth. And, and that's, where, that's where we're going. But anyway, talked about the microbiome as an intelligent semi-permeable membrane. When it's unbalanced, that's where you get, and here's another representation. To the right, you get these aggressive opportunistic organisms because when the microbiome becomes unbalanced, the early colonizers, these, this beautiful, thin, clear, odorless film, you wake up, and that's why Promoting microbial homeostasis is the most important thing that we need to do in the mouth, in oral care. Promoting microbial homeostasis. So the three biggest things that I'd like everyone to leave uh, here today knowing is one, we're made of microbes. Two, the microbes run us. They have 100 times the genetic information of our own human cells. So we're walking bacteria containers. The microbes run us, we don't run them. And the third and most important is the best way to promote 
real health and wellness, and, and that's why I love the term bioregulatory. Our body has self-regulatory, self-healing mechanisms, and those occur when we make peace with our microbes, when we respect that microbial flora. And so here is a classic example of Fusobacterium nucleatum. It's a commensal bacteria turned pathogen when, when we, as I like to say, piss it off and try to kill it. Listerine, kill germs on contact. Colgate Total, kill germs 24 hours a day. Um, triclosan is dentistry's uh, answer to glyphosate, Roundup. Roundup. So, uh, and, and it's interesting because they both increased host antibiotic resistance. So uh, not only does triclosan, uh, I'll get into it in a minute, but so the change in assumptions is, you know, we had the Roundup approach in the mouth, but what we really want to be doing is organic gardening. I'm going to jump over these quickly because I had them in the presentation. <laughs> but dental mercury, Dr. Call is going to talk about all the fuss. Um, there's probably the equivalent of, you know, four thermometers of mercury in there. So um, if any dentist calls a dental amalgam a silver filling, they're lying because it's 52% mercury and 26% silver. We all know that. Greatest source of um, heavy metal toxicity uh, and pollution, mercury pollution in the earth. The World Health Organization has said 90% comes from dental offices. So, and if you look at this graph, here's um, percentage-wise the amount of mercury that comes from dental fillings, vaccines, and then seafood. I love that seafood's down, down over there. The uh, micrograms of mercury per day is about two. It's like if, if a physician sees, um, I mean, it's a common response. It's like, you know, oh, your mercury's a little high in your blood test. Um, eat less tuna, you know. <laughs> They're walking around with a mouthful of amalgams. Um, so when I went on Dr. Oz for um, this piece he did on toxic fillings, with his, doc, Dr. Oz's dentist to the left, Dr. Levine, was talking about how the newer materials are stronger and all, and I was on there saying mercury is the most neurotoxic element on earth, and they actually filmed in my office um, safe mercury removal for four hours. They were in my office for four hours, and we went through the entire process of how to remove it safely because I subscribed to the IAOMT's program, which is uh, a protocol that is as effective as we can be to controlling exposure to the patient, to myself, uh, to my staff, and the young women who work in the uh, Many young women work in dentistry, in dental assisting, dental hygiene positions, and they are exposed to toxic levels uh, of, of mercury. Uh, because, you know, you stick a drill in a mercury filling and it just makes a invisible cloud. It's odorless, tasteless, and invisible. Yet, um, oh, this is no news. Um, yeah, the head of the FDA was actually um, um, a former counsel to one of the biggest distributors of dental mercury. Um, the, um, th this is a, a, a YouTube video you can get. It's an old one and a good one on the smoking tooth and you can basically, this is with a miner's light, you can see that mercury, that's on an extracted tooth, and, and uh, you can see mercury coming, coming off of there. So it off-gasses constantly, and you know, we are excretors, most of us are excretors, except the percentage of us who are deficient in the APO4 gene, and these are people that get very, very sick. Um, um, this was a great um, movie that um, um, I actually uh, contributed to and the IOMT supported um, uh, the, the making of this movie, but it did a good job at getting a message out. And I'd recommend you show this to your patients, have your patients look at it. It's called Evidence of Harm. I think um, Randall has the entire thing online now, right? I think you can just watch it. Oh, great. We have a couple of copies of this. This is 
I highly recommend you either download it or have it but, and see it. It really shows the politics. The American Dental Association was founded by pro-mercury dentists in the late 1800s. And they actually, there were two dental organizations, it was called the Amalgam Wars, and uh, the pro-mercury dentist won. But if you want to know why the ADA is, is so intransigent about acknowledging the dangers of dental mercury, um, there's, there's a lot of reasons, including political and legal, um, behind that. So, very interesting, the symptoms of mercury poisoning, the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease are, are identical. Identical. And so this was a really bright idea of a mutual friend of ours, Dr. Collins and I, who, who, who um, created a certification for biologic dentists to follow um, to safely remove uh, amalgam. It's called SMART, so they're SMART dentists. Go to a SMART dentist. <laughs> Safe mercury amalgam removal technique. Um, and uh, I also use this. This is a hydrolyzed canoptolite fragment. As a physician uh, at the Cleveland Clinic developed this, um, but it's really good. We use a whole, whole bunch of things when we take uh, mercury out, including activated charcoal, chlorella, and uh, this binder. Uh, under the tongue. This is really good and we give patients a bottle of this to take with them. Um, another supplement, you know, this has a glutathione. This is by a company, Systemic Formulas. It has glutathione and it also has an activated charcoal um, in bind um, that is really good for elimination. Um, let me talk about brew canals for a minute because um, these were, um, this book was written by a um, dentist whose license was taken away. He was the president of his class at New York University and a really bright dentist. But he was coming out against recommending that patients who had root canals have those teeth extracted. And he was brought up on disciplinary charges and also had his license taken away. And he wrote this book after that. Um, I know Bob Kulas, I was the president of my class uh, at NYU the year ahead of him, and so we worked together all the time. He was a very, he is a very bright, thoughtful doctor, and he was with this MD who is also um, a, a, um, on a JD. So this was very, very well written to uh, inform uh, patients of the dangers of root canal. And I'm going to go through this because it's a big, spooky area, root canal. And, and uh, the concept is that when you have, I don't have a pointer on here, but in the second tooth there, you could see decay and breakdown causing an abscess. And the idea was, oh, then you do this files in the canals and uh, you put this uh, inner uh, filling material called gutta percher and magically the abscess goes away. Well, that is not the case, okay? And you have all kinds of conditions. That is a giant cavitation infection um, around that root canal. You have things like that actually has a broken instrument in the canal, which is not that uncommon in root canal therapy. The, the big problem with root canal therapy is trapping toxins um, in, and you have thousands and thousands of tubules in what's called the dentin of the tooth. And those tubules, bacteria actually har harbor in there and die. And you end up taking teeth out that look like this. This is not uncommon. This is a tooth that didn't give the patient any pain, any fever, any swelling and uh, yet it was a chronic infection. So, you know, the, uh, the main thing is, um, you know, there are microscopic channels that are literally left untouched after root, a root canal treatment made up of dead rotting nerves and bacteria feed off this and the toxic waste leaks into your bloodstream and that's, these are some of the dangers down here, arthritis, heart disease, neurodegenerative disease, digestion disorders, and, and all of these things. And Dr. Rao at Paracelsus, Dr. Hal Huggins, 
have been talking about this a very long time. And it's true, and yet th there are some times where there are teeth, you know, even in the front of the mouth, um, that have root canals th that, um, that are done improperly, and the infections I'll show you just, oh, I, th I don't think I have this in my cavitation lecture. I show these large lesions from failing root canals. Um, some of the advantages now with lasers are doing a better job of disinfecting teeth. Um, so we're really starting to see promise, but any tooth that has an abscess that a dentist recommends a root canal, I would, I would recommend you consider immediate extraction because I do not believe when you have a pre-existing dental abscess, um, you are asking for problems by sealing that with, an, and, uh, with a, um, a, a root canal. Uh, and the dental literature even supports extraction and dental implant replacement is more predictable long-term, structurally, <clears throat> not even biologically, structurally. The de uh, dental, uh, in, in the dental research, they're supporting implants over root canals. The root canals also make teeth very brittle. They break, they, and, and they um, can really wreak havoc. So we're experimenting using that. Fluoride, I'll go very quickly. We're getting way too much. As Dick, Dick Tom said, you know, you may, not, you may drink bottled water and have a filter in your home, but you go to a restaurant and they're cooking with fluoridated water. We have a huge, huge problem with the amount of fluoride, and now we have <clears throat> this was 2004, 2006, the study came out uh, that four out of 10 adolescent children in the United States have teeth damage by fluoride, fluorosis, making them more prone to decay, the very thing they were given a toxic halide to protect them from. You know, fluoride we thought was a good idea <clears throat> because it's so reactive that it blows out the hydroxy element in hydroxyapatite, what our teeth and bones are made of, it blows it out and it becomes fluorapatite. And then we looked at fluorapatite and it's really, really hard. But it's 40% more brittle than natural teeth and bones, which has elasticity. So when my mother was drinking fluoridated water in the 1980s, she tripped on a step, a carpeted step in, our, in, our, in, in her home she didn't get a bruise on her hip, she had a broken hip. So skeletal fluorosis was already taking place and the orthopedists in the 1980s, New England Journal of Medicine, Journal of the American Medical Association, there were several orthopedic studies that showed an exponential increase in hip fractures um, correlating with since the time of fluoridation. So that, those are just little, forget about um, the uh, study from Birmingham, England on hypothyroidism and all kinds of other things. Fluoride is toxic. There's enough fluoride, and by the way, this is mild fluorosis, just white spots. Oh, they're just cosmetic, cosmetic white spots. No, those are hypocalcifications, and when it gets um, severe, as 16% um, of those 41 have severe, moderate to severe fluorosis, and they need thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of reconstructive dentistry. Veneers and caps and all kinds of things. So these are just some of the uh, problems with fluoride, but we are being overdosed and no dose. You know, what's crazy is that now we know that a healthy microbiome maintains calcium balance and, and mineralization of teeth mineralization of teeth by just having a healthy microbiome. And uh, this was also a good study along with the other evidence of harm. Um, and uh, another interesting fact was that fluoride is so, the, in New York City we're paying $12 million to put uh, a toxic waste product from phosphate fertilizer mining, manufacturing, aluminum manufacturing, and even uranium enrichment. Re uranium enrichment produces a lot of um, hydrofluorosalicylic acid, uh, and this 
um, this acid is highly corrosive. Um, the, it's highly corrosive and most of the old pipes in cities are lined with lead. And so you have this lead crisis, which could have been from the fluoride because they had a study that got squashed very quickly, New York City drinking water in schools, in old school buildings, um, because of the um, hydrofluorosilicic, silicic, not salicylic, that, that's aspirin, uh, hydrofluorosilicic acid, um, which is um, highly toxic. So toxic you have to wear hazmat suits. And it's what they make sarin gas out of, is hydrofluorosilicic acid. And that they're dumping into the water, conveniently, into the water, um, and there's a lot of movements now, and God bless social media because people are mobilizing to really stand up against uh, this, in my opinion, poisoning of the water supply under the guise of preventative dentistry that has been a complete failure. So there are fluoridated communities with higher rates of decay than non-fluoridated communities. Documented. And... Um, this was, uh, I found this interesting, you know, everything, um, uh, fulvic acid, coffee enemas, and getting fluoride out. I think that's going to be a big move to get fluoride out of the body. It's very difficult because it's very tightly bound to the appetite. Fluor appetite is a very tight mineral um, because fluoride is the most highly charged. So the flor fluorine, by the way, fluoride's a made up word. Fluorine, the element on the periodic table, is the most highly reactive, non-radioactive element on the periodic table. But let's talk about toothpaste. Why is there a poison warning on toothpaste? Because there's enough toothpaste um, in an average sized tube to kill two children under five. So in 1988, when a Crest Sparkle toothpaste came out, which was fluorescent blue, bubblegum flavored with sparkles in it. Children were eating it, and fluoride fatalities went up 280%. But that was before the internet. We didn't hear much about that. And it took the FDA um, 10 years to put a poison warning on the toothpaste. So they have this warning on every tube of toothpaste. You see the bottom there. Keep out of reach of children six years of age. Okay. Keep out of reach of children. Kids were taking the toothpaste and just eating it. Um, if more than used for brushing, actually it used to say a pea-sized amount, get medical help or contact the Poison Control Center right away. And um, really, thank you, really interesting that um, that's toothpaste. But this is the glyphosate <clears throat> um, of the oral care industry. So triclosan has been linked to everything. So the FDA this year banned, I'm sorry, last, um, last fall or last year, banned triclosan in all of these products. It banned the use of triclosan for arid antibacterial underarm deodorant and, and all of this stuff except toothpaste. So the stuff you stick in your mouth, triclosan is still not banned, but all the stuff that you stick on your body is. The soaps, the underarm, and you know, all of this stuff. So actually the Colgate is in there, that shouldn't have been in there, but. Um, and then I was um, relaxing on my summer vacation in Ravello, Italy, and I had the international uh, People magazine, and there's Kelly Ripa there talking about my routine for a healthier smile with her over white veneers, and, and it says um, eliminates 15 times more bacteria to improve the health of your mouth. So let's just napalm in the morning. I love, love the smell of napalm in the morning. And, you know, um, let's just nuke the mouth. And that's good. So that is, that to me is unethical advertising. And when you think about the center that we're building in Providence and the demands that were put on us by the Rhode Island Department of Health um, about our marketing, because they're afraid about our marketing, 
and you have major companies. Now Colgate makes $4.3 billion a year on Colgate Total. But let's talk about triclosan for a minute. Triclosan has an indefinite afterlife in human tissue. Um, as a matter of fact, it doesn't biodegrade. And when you spit it out, it kills algae and fish in estuaries and streams. So it was really the EPA that was petitioning the FDA to get rid of triclosan. Triclosan is an endocrine disruptor. It affects thyroid function. And there's all kinds of studies that around the world this. But this third one is very similar to glyphosate. It's, it actually, not only are there triclosan resistant bacteria in the oral microbiome that have been identified in the oral microbiome, but triclosan increases antibiotic resistance to all antibiotics. So it's a, it's, a, it's a real problem. And then you have carcinogens when exposed to chlorine in tap water. It forms chloroform. When you do city chlorinated tap water, rinsing out a product with triclosan that you're brushing your teeth with, it forms chloroform molecules. Um, it's strongly linked to um, uh, various disorders like asthma, allergies, and eczema, and it was recently linked to cardiac and skeletal muscular we um, weakness and disorders. But 60%, um, I think it was, uh, it is 60% is stored in women's breast milk. So this is a nasty ingredient. Again, the approach was, how do you kill plaque? So the studies on that, by the way, Colgate only did six month studies. Uh, on that, and they did the studies in the Philippines. The initial study, triclosan, was in, in the Philippines. And, you know, there are the Colgate banners at the American Dental Association meeting. Everything is red and white. You know, they actually, when they launched Colgate Total, they were going to launch it as the antibiotic toothpaste. But there was a, I'm, I forget his name, who was at, who was at um, Tufts University, a microbiologist who was saying, stop. He, the overuse of antibiotics is, is killing us. And, and other doctors like Marty Blazer, uh, who wrote the book Missing Microbes. So he discovered that um, H. pylori caused ulcers. So he was on an antibiotic trip to kill the H. pylori. Go on an antibiotic. And then he's like, no, you don't want to do that. You really don't want to do that. Um, so. Uh, he wrote the book, Missing Microbes, um, all about that. But I want to talk about a few other toxicity dangers. Sugar alcohols is a major pet peeve of mine. Xylitol, uh, erythritol were presented as natural sugar alternatives. They are not. They are sugar alcohols that are made by an industrialized process uh, and the end ingredient is a high-value chemical. So how many here are xylitol fans? Anybody xylitol fans? Um, I hope this opens your eyes a little bit because xylitol A is not absorbed nor metabolized by the human body. It is highly disruptive to the oral microbiome and the gut microbiome, which is why you get wicked intestinal gas and diarrhea when you eat xylitol-containing products. And they brought xylitol gum. So the xylitol industry is actually uh, predominantly owned by DuPont under its subsidiary Danica. And the studies on xylitol, a lot of them were done in Finland. You'll see a lot of PubMed studies. And it's all about how it keeps plaque from sticking to teeth. It, um, it suppresses Streptococcus mutans bacteria, which cause tooth decay. No imbalanced streptococcus mutants and an imbalanced oral microbiome can lead to tooth decay. But strep mutans live in the mouth. They're in your mouth right now. And um, so the big problem with xylitol is that it is a chemical. It is a white powder chemical. It starts from pretty little birch bark. Not really. 80% of xylitol comes from GMO corn cobs. Okay? Very cheap source of raw materials. Cheap source of xylan. GMO corn cobs. Lots of that out there. Um, birch bark, yeah, but wherever, I, it, if it comes from pretty birch bark, you know, massaged by Tibetan monks, it does not matter. 
okay? Because it ends up a high value chemical that goes through a hydrogenation process that uses rainy nickel as the catalyst, heavy metal as the catalyst. So I am so angry at the misinformation that has been propagated by this new methadone to the sugar business. You know, we just come up with new methadone for the heroin, right? Sugar is more addictive than heroin, but um, you have, um, you know, aspartame, saccharin, you know, you have a whole chain, and these were the new darlings, and uh, they are, they're, they're bad. Now, this was a, FDA warns, sweetener xylitol can kill or poison dogs. So dogs don't, don't um, they, you know, it can kill your pet. Um, they had a study that two pieces of xylitol can kill a 100 gram rat. So they're thinking of it for rat poison, <laughs> rat poison. Um, so natural toothpaste is safe. Here's an example of a natural toothpaste. I took the toothpaste off because the guy's a friend of mine who started it. And, um, and he had everything to kill. Tea tree oil is as antimicrobial as, as triclosan. You're nuking the microbiome. Licorice root, Tulsi oil, xylitol is antimicrobial. So I spent 20 years developing this. I'm proud to say we're the first prebiotic. Uh, I don't use the term probiotic, we're promicrobial, we foster microbial homeostasis. And we have now, I want like everybody um, to check out, we, I love vitamin K2, MQ7, and the microbiome company who's here who has the spore biotic products, that's, those are wonderful. Uh, they have a great K2 that I've discovered, uh, an MQ7 from non-soy based uh, origins. And uh, so we started looking at what happens if we just get out of the way and make peace with our microbes and put together basically a nutraceutical type um, formulation that acts like a toothpaste. So what I did 20 years ago is I deconstructed toothpaste and I got out the detergent origin and started with a base of vitamin C and CoQ10 because there was a study in um, Japan, uh, where they biopsied diseased gums and they saw that there were two um, important nutrients that were highly deficient. Coenzyme Q10, which is an important cofactor in the manufacture of ATP, every cell to make energy. And so the most amount of CoQ10 is needed by three, three places. The heart, your skin, and your mouth, your gums. Greatest metabolic need, greatest need for CoQ10. So um, in seven days, we reduced inflammation more than Colgate Total did in 12 weeks. And that's just by getting out of the way. Just foster this. Um, we did a second study in Italy to stay away from our friends at the FDA who would label us as a drug because we were looking at structure function claims like stopping bleeding, reducing plaque, and reducing gingival inflammation. But this is just one of a number of pro-microbiome approaches that really has profound effects. This was four days. If you look at the gum tissue to the tooth on the front of the right um, front tooth, in four days, it's down. People's gums stop bleeding in two days. That's promoting bioregulatory care. The body has self-regulatory self-healing mechanisms, and when we, in the words of Rodney King, who said, can't we all just get along? Yeah, we have to really make peace with our microbes. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm not gonna tell, show you any more. <laughs> thank you. And they want me to take questions? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> that's a periodontal chart. And actually, that's someone, they were measuring the pockets and all, and on the left was his chart in June of 2016. And then in, in September of 2016, he went back. <clears throat> it had completely healed reattachment, reduction of inflammation, reduction of those pockets you're talking about checking. 
self-regulatory, self-healing mechanisms. You know, Revitin just fostered his ability to heal. And he needed, and by the way, those two, three black dots were areas where he, they bled where they stuck the probe. It, it bled. Look at all the black dots he had, those, and, and those went away completely, he said. At his follow-up, he, he goes for a periodontal visit every season, once every three months. Yes? Yes, <clears throat> that's an excellent point. What happens when the inflammation goes down is there's another whole repair process that goes on. So the only thing that we are, the, the greatest repair we see is with soft, soft tissue. Where we don't see as much repair and where we're using other things, and we're, we're starting to use stem cells, exosomes, um, uh, and also laser. So I use a, um, um, an erbium chromium YAG laser, the BioLays, WaterLays 2.0. It has a wavelength of light that stimulates division, cellular division of bone cells, mitotic division of osteoblast, osteoblast. Osteoblasts make new bone, and we're using a laser to, to excite the bone to regenerate. So, but, you know, these are the kinds of therapies that we're seeing that are very exciting for people's mouths to heal and repair. Yes? That's, that's a, an excellent point. Do I have a remineralization process? Yeah, his question was, do I have a remineralization protocol and process? Um, it starts with nutrition and definitely increasing the amounts of essential fatty acids. You know, Weston Price wrote a book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. He was actually, I, didn't, I, could, I could do a whole lecture just on things that he proposed, but he actually proposed ways that teeth can remineralize. And, and we can foster that remineralization. But you need a healthy microbiome to do that. Yes? What about erythritol? Ah, erythritol. Erythritol is absorbed by the body but not metabolized. And it's been linked to esophageal cancer because it causes a lot of reflux. Erythritol is a sugar alcohol as well. Um, it's a little more sinister because it gets into the body, but it, it's not excreted. So it has a half-life in the body that's really long. Erythritol, yeah. I would have, please, please avoid the sugar alcohols. Yeah, I mean, there's a, some things about stevia, you know, uh, by the way, there is GMO stevia right now. <laughs> they look for non-GMO whole leaf stevia and use it in moderation. Yes. No, I'm, I'm, it's basically the mechanical process, the detergent process of stripping from the mouth. So whether you use great organic coconut oil or sesame oil, which is what Ayurveda really um, um, used to um, um, recommend, um, you know, that was different. But no, this mechanical process can shift you from a thick, sticky, scary microbiome to a desert where you're not properly protected. That's where you get erosion, tooth sensitivity, gum recession, that kind of thing. Right, you can do it, yeah. It's not a harmful process on a short-term basis, but as a regular hygienic practice, you're gonna create an atrophic biofilm. I, I, I gotta jump around, yeah. I can't hear you. I, oh, sylvodiamine. No, I don't. I don't have any experience with that. And I don't, I haven't seen any studies on how that modulates the oral microbiome. Could you come to the mic maybe? It would be helpful. Sorry, <laughs> I'm making you walk a long way here. <laughs> You did. You could have came that way. <laughs> okay, thank you. So um, I'm a bit 
pediatric dentists and a professor at the University of Louisville. So for me, it's a little bit conflicting to fight with all the science and go to the right side. But we are using the SDF in kids, and it's been showing a great, great results. Wonderful. Um, I'm from Colombia, and we used it 30 it, years ago, and it was working, but everybody shut it down. But now it's coming. It's coming. Yeah, I know there's a resurgence in it, and I, I have to say I haven't done any research with it, and, and so I'm not that familiar with it, but I have heard some promising things. Yes. I look at everything through the filter of is it fostering microbial homeostasis? Is it fostering? Because we have self-healing, self-regulatory mechanisms that are in our mouth. So it looks like I work with the biofilm of the cariogenic bacteria and suppress them. So I yes. think that would be a great way that's to... Where my, that's yes. where my concern is. Because again, we think we have to modulate them yeah. when they actually modulate us. What we really have to do is... Um, we really have to enable our di dental sialomicrobial complex to work effectively because there's a lot of factors in how decay occurs, including what's going on with saliva, yes. nutrition. I mean, all, it, it's so multifactorial that yeah. to just say oh, I'm using silver di um, um, diamine, fluoride. diamine fluoride. So it's promoting remineralization so the tubules of the dentin get closed and the bacteria doesn't progress. So, I mean, I have seen but it. But you're, again, I think you're focused more on Yeah, the, so we need to know You're focused how more on the symptoms, treating the symptoms, like the decay doesn't progress. Yeah. I would go more to the cause. Well, what was causing the decay in the first place? Yeah, you but know what I mean? it's like, you, like you have to look at the causal chain and, and not just at the, um, you know, at the symptom that's presenting. So yeah, you're, we are you're using treating, it. And that has been our focus in dentistry, fix the cavity. Get the cavity not to progress. Get the cavity not to, do, we have to go beyond that. Yeah, we, we understand that, but it is an epidemic. I mean, you have kids that are two years old and we have to take to the OR and extract yeah. all the teeth. So at no, least I, with I, this, we, we kind of hold it yeah, and educate parents. Yeah, I, I want to tell you that I really appreciate that and I think okay. that that is a good thing. So but we need I think to work the, on that. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I think ozone is a is is an essential um, treatment in acute infection, but I am not a subscriber to um, to a number of biologic practices that you overuse ozone, and they use ozone as if oh you go to the you sit in with the hygienist and she gives you ozonated trays and just nukes because ozone obviously converts to peroxide, and it's highly antimicrobial. But ozone gas is able to penetrate places where nothing else can. And so ozone has a wonderful application in, in, in infection control, and, and, but not in, a, as a panacea you know, for um, ozonating the mouth over and over and over, because we're destroying um, what is the unique ability of the di dental sialomicrobial complex to cause our mouths to stay in homeostasis. And by the way, um, you improve the oral microbiome, you also improve the gut microbiome. So, you know, we're not, this is this whole intimate connection. Is there, do we have time for, uh, yep. Sure, please. They cut it out. So what it did, what it did, it was the worst thing that I, and I was so angry because, and the IOMT was angry with me because they thought, oh, why don't you show safe removal and this and that? And I was like, because I'm not the producer. And they had me talk about foods. Um, they talk, had me talk about chlorella and cilantro binding to heavy metals and this and that. It scared patients. That Dr. Oz piece scared patients to go to their dentist and rip their silver fillings out unsafely. So I venture to say that there were thousands of people that said, I'm getting these silver fillings out. Hey, doc, I want my silver fillings out. And the guy went in there, stuck a drill in there, and took these silver fillings out. So unfortunately, um, that was the repercussion of that. And I would never do a piece like that again without insisting that that's an essential component. Do I have access to? Yeah, 
Yeah, actually, you can go online. Yeah, so you can go um, um, Dr. Oz Show on Google, Dr. Oz Show, Toxic Fillings, and you can put my name and you'll see the segments. They actually did three segments. It was the whole show. So, the, um, you know, a lot of dentists who had wanted to get the word out about mercury were really happy about it. And then there was this, like, other side where, you know, they were coming at, the biologic dentists were coming at me going, why don't your show safe removal? What is it? We did a whole um, CEREC, um, which is a 3D printer, which we're going to use in Providence for the safe removal of dental mercury and then manufacturing a ceramic restoration while the patient was in the chair. And, you know, and, and it's, so you have a strong, resilient restoration with the safe removal of toxic mercury. Yes? Oh, good question. Teeth whitening, uh, and I'll finish with that. And we, we'll, do we, th I think that's, do we have time for more questions? Or Time's up. Um, teeth whitening, oxidative process. Oxidation is the same thing that rush, rush your wrought iron furniture. So if you're gonna do teeth whitening, which everybody likes whiter teeth, I do something called brighten and balance. So we isolate the gums and the soft tissue. We use the teeth whitening material and then I give them an antioxidant gum mask when they're done. But do it in a controlled way. Do not use the over-the-counter garbage. It's highly acidic. You swallow it, and, it's, and it is um, damaging um, to the mouth. Uh, it really is. It can make your teeth very sensitive, but it basically nukes the microbiome, all that peroxide, carbamide peroxide. Very abrasive. Very abrasive. Baking soda is very abrasive. You know, the baking soda and salt thing and everything, that's very abrasive. So, uh, yes? Very oxidative, yeah. No, hydrogen peroxide nukes everything. It's like ozone, peroxide, you know, it, it is nuking. You don't want to gargle because you, you feel like, I've got to kill those germs, but you're killing everything. <laughs> I'd rather see you spray some uh, nano silver or Argentin 23, um, you know, a nano silver or colloidal silver product that has more of an affinity for pathogens than for um, non-pathogenic bacteria. Yep, thank you, thank you.